Welcome to another episode of Southern Arizona Nonprofits, the superheroes impacting our community. This is brought to you today by SCIP, SSCIP, the Social Service Contractors Indemnity Pool that's been covering nonprofits for more than 40 years. This is Barbara McClure, your host today, and I have with us two local leaders of nonprofits that have been very busy during the COVID season. I have with me Megan Headings, who is the Executive Director of Family Housing Resources. I always want to get that backwards. <laughs> and also with me, Dr. John Arnold of PPEP, which is PPEP, Portable Practical Educational Preparation. So thank you both for being with me here today. Thank you. Thank you. you bet. We're talking about uh, the critical services that have been going on for the last year. It's hard to believe we've come all the way through a year of COVID. But I know uh, PPEP from Impact of Southern Arizona, because when I first got to the organization, we were housing PPEP's um, classes in one of our buildings. So they would come up weekly to provide services for our community in the rural, rural community. So, John, I thought it would be fun for you to tell us what you're doing with food. I know right now you've got a lot of people you're feeding, and there's quite a bit going on. Well, the rural areas I have been in a pandemic for the last 50 years. Our mm-hmm. services are uh, last on the, anybody's list. Our roads are the worst. And we have, um, you know, just uh, because of the distances between our communities, there's just um, no access to services. And so we've tried to fulfill that void in the last 50 years, starting in an old school bus named La Tortuga and driving around to the farm labor camps up until we're still driving around for the food security. Every Thursday, we practically visit every one of those original communities that we first started in, taking food boxes through the uh, Farmers uh, to Family Program, where USDA is buying the uh, food that would ordinarily go to restaurants, putting them into food boxes. Each food box weighs about 35 pounds, enough to feed four people for a whole week. So with our organization and our staff, we take turns and we go out and we uh, load up a a truck, which we, it's a refrigerated uh, semi that we take, and it goes out to uh, deliver these boxes. Last Thursday, we handed out boxes benefiting 2,400 people. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you look in the rural context, there's a huge, huge amount of uh, resources going out there. We start around 7 in the morning with our partner, the 3000 Club, and we have a lot of uh, thanks to Pam Boyer and that one floor organization for what they do. And we partner to uh, distribute the food, so that's where that's going on. So we hit the areas of uh, Marana, Rito, South Tucson, uh, Amado, Aravac, and then we swing around to my hometown, which is Patagonia, Arizona. So, <laughs> and then come back, and I load up my Prius, and we take out food boxes to about 40 refugees uh, in that evening and get home. Time for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long Thursday. So that's, that's food security <laughs> on Thursday. Sure. Well, that's a lot of people you're serving, really. And I, I know Megan and I know each other yes. originally through the Community Food Bank because she worked there for many years. And then um, Impact, of course, is an agency of the Community Food Bank and United Food Bank as well. So we are all very familiar with food service. But 2,400 people in a day does not sound like a no, small number. it does not. That's a large number. <laughs> that is, and we appreciate what you do. I know you also have an Aravaca garden. Maybe you could tell me some of that well, story. Uh, yes, back in 1972, um, I was driving with a friend of mine. And he had just come back from Vietnam. We saw they were selling 40-acre parcels down there and that for about $400 an acre. And I thought that sounded pretty good. And there was a creek that went through it. And uh, myself and my partner bought the property and split it up later when we both got married. And then uh, uh, he did a little bit of cattle uh, grazing there with Black Angus. And then that fertilized and laid the platform for an organic garden later on, which we're benefiting from that <laughs> that particular episode. And the garden uh, today, uh, our my family has turned it over to uh, our PEP organization to operate, and uh, they have some green two ninety foot greenhouses. They're air cooled by evaporative cooling, so we can do things a year round. And it seems like we're not only feeding people, but we're feeding the javelina and deer. Which, <laughs> 
down there this year because they could go through metal fences. We found out, and oh, gosh. they're hungry, so we try mm. to accommodate all all creatures here. But uh, we do believe in uh, vegan conscientious farming. Mm. On our website, ppep.org, you can find a primer uh, that is probably one of the best ever produced, and uh, how to do your own conscientious vegan farming. And that is something I think is very, very important that we need to move to that. Uh, just one cow takes up about 14 acres, and you could feed the world 10 times over if there weren't, we weren't producing so much beef. So uh, that's something uh, maybe just to consider. But organic farming, and also we've uh, branched down into Cameroon. We have 54 farms under our microloan program, basically in a conflict area between the Anglophone and the French phone folks that are in conflict. Our farms are keeping the people from starving. We have a through Rotary, we started really a nice one in Ghana, my wife's home country. And then in uh, Liberia, Ground Zero, where Ebola emerged, uh, we are now producing rice. So a uh, nice. little bit of this and that. And, uh, yeah, we try to – food security didn't knows no boundaries, mm-hmm. and so we have right. to be very care- conscious of that. Well, I think it's great you're serving not just Tucson but mm-hmm. international areas as well. That's, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Really a, really a superhero in the food business, it sounds like. Well, I think there's several that you have to recognize. We talked about the 3000 Club and Pam Boyer. Sure. Also, uh, Eric Scheidel with the Gilbert Food Bank. They're up in Phoenix, but they also have a branch down here across from Pio Decimo on South 6th. They are one of the major providers statewide of food uh, boxes, and they're a great team to to work with so there's a good network and we have a great ne- network in each of our rural communities we have our own board members that that are from those areas that's how we get our boards and they help set up the volunteers and we get there we unload they distribute so it's a very efficient uh, operation in the rural areas it's interesting when you get to Aravaca, you wouldn't think you need two sheriff uh, cars are there to direct traffic <laughs> but uh, you can see the line as far as you can see and uh yeah it's it's a uh, hunger is a real issue right mm-hmm. now and people are not aware of it but hunger has always been an issue in the yes. rural areas and have it's not just a hunger for food but it's good food and that's mm-hmm. what and a lot of our brothers and sisters on the the nations they sometimes they cannot get good water so they have to buy these huge 18 uh, uh ounce uh, sodas and things like that mm-hmm. for and and that has its effects on 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 health. So, it, it is a an issue of not only hunger but having access to good sanitary and healthy food. Sure, I know it impacts. We've had um, we've really evolved, and we now have a really large grocery rescue, mm-hmm. um, I guess base if you want to call it that. But recently, the produce that's been coming in looks gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It's just like it's right off the market's primary shelf. Wow. And so that is exactly, nice. if you look at these food boxes, they're 35 pounds, as I mentioned, but they have a, a bag of potatoes from Idaho. They have apples. They have yogurt. They have two kinds of, of meats in there that are pre-cooked. I mean, that's the high-quality puree that would go to restaurants, you know. And uh, then they have uh, cottage cheeses and veggies and everything. You would be amazed at the quality of, of food. And I really give credit to USDA uh, for having the foresight of uh, keeping the farmers going but mm-hmm. keeping the families going as well. And I think all this nutrition starts at the home level. Uh, mm-hmm. We can preach all that we want. I'm very fortunate to be married to a Ghanaian woman who uh, came from the rainforest area, uh, grew up in um, in the natural ways, and we were both vegan, and I think that's what attracted us. And that it really, uh, I think, projects forward with our children they are all uh, healthy, and they are all uh, doing well. And I think all comes back to eating well, resting well, and being happy. There you go. I think that's a good combination. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think, too, the, for us at Impact, there's that whole other part, as you were saying, people are just they're hungry, but also it's about dignity and respect. And for us, it's really important to give people high-quality food and not – just vegetables that look like they've got a day left on them or wilted and things like that so it's um feeds their soul as well as their bellies which is important yeah well i know um 
Megan, as I had said, worked for the food bank as well, the community food bank. So we've we've all connected through food for sure. But I know right now the big thing on our in the news and kind of in our concerns with our clients are all these issues around housing. And of course we came through COVID with all these wonderful opportunities for people to stay in place, but then they didn't yeah. keep up on their rents and that's been pretty concerning, especially as all those moratoriums begin to lift. Yes. So Megan, what are you doing over there at the Family Housing Resources to help people through this? Well, thanks for period. asking. It's definitely challenging times, I think, you know, coming from a background working at the Community Food Bank and with all the wonderful partners um, and understanding how great the need of food insecurity was prior to the pandemic. You know, I think it it relates to all of the other basic needs um, and housing being one of those critical areas. And so at Family Housing Resources, we've been really, um, we kind of pivoted and shifted quickly to respond to the needs of housing during the pandemic. And a big part of that has been through rental assistance. So we did see, um, you know, a a lot of concerns about being able to pay rent. We have a lot of um, both our tenants at our properties as well as outside in the community coming to us and asking for help. They had lost their jobs initially or had been impacted by increased financial expenses, medical expenses, folks that had had COVID and sort of got knocked down and and really struggled to get back up. And so we've um, been really fortunate to have a sort of a seed fund for rental assistance and um, put that in place. And then we were also able to partner with both the city and the county on the initial CARES funds. Mm-hmm. And so um, we've been a, a service agency to getting out both rental assistance and utility assistance, which is equally as important right now. Um, so those those programs are sort of a, a emergency stopgap just to help get people through um, so they don't lose housing. You know, we, we face these, as you said, those moratoriums you know, running out to the ex- their dates that were supposed to um, end. And um, luckily, the state of Arizona governor early on in the pandemic did put in place a second moratorium that really helped to protect folks. But there's been other states that didn't do that. And now you know, there's clear um, indication that the rates of death were highly um, increased in states that didn't carry forward any moratoriums, didn't carry forward that protection. And it's because housing is critical. It's critical for your safety, for your well-being, and in this case, for your ability to stay healthy. So, you know, we are, we're passionate about it. We think, you know, you, you need housing first before you can go out and start to seek some of those additional services before, you know, so that you can go out and start finding job support, food support, those other types of activities. So we are here to sort of continue that fight. We are still working with um, CIC, which is Community Investment Corporation, on the city and county funds now. They have about $24 million that they're distributing in rental assistance and utility assistance at this moment. So, Gosh, and is it easy to get a hold of? Do you know we've been passing those flyers out through the food yeah. bank, but... I think the demand is going to be so high. It's really, it's really hard process, and I would say, you know, um, there was, there's been such lapse in coverage. So at the end of November, the county program ended, and and um, the city program hadn't been closed for a while, just working through a wait list. And so there's been people on a wait list, and those are the ones that are getting served first. They've sort of done a good job of being able to identify who's highest risk, who's most at risk of eviction at this moment, and trying to serve those people first. Um, But it is going to be challenging. I think the the number of individuals seeking assistance and the number, you know, and how long it takes to go through the process, there's just we're looking at a couple months. And so even though there are funds there, it requires that protection so people don't get evicted while they're waiting for the support that's available. Sure. Is there transitional housing available in Tucson that you know of for those people who have lost their home while they're waiting? Yeah, that's, I would say, even harder, um, frankly. So there is some, the city does have some programs. They did, you know, they have been doing some hotel vouchers and they have some programs to do that. Although what I see as our biggest concern is really supply. So mm-hmm. at this point, there are even some rehousing dollars. So, you know, if you did get evicted, that there is some support available for rehousing. And the issue comes down to an inability to find 
open units to find that housing opportunity that we can get people in that's truly affordable. We have, you know, prices have also increased significantly over the last year in both housing for rental and for purchase. And it's quite astonishing, I think, that that what we're looking at is going to cause problems for folks for years to come. You know, even one of our staff members was saying the other day that she's in an apartment Mm -hmm. and the rent and she's her lease is up. And she was saying that the rent on, say, an $800 apartment has gone up $150. Yeah. Which is, it was really surprising to me because I thought right now when everybody's struggling, you would think it's just supply and demand, I'm sure. But it was tough. Well, and I think this pandemic has um, separated that gap even more. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's what's crushing to me is, is the fact that we're seeing a greater divide. And so those that, you know, maybe already had housing or had secondary housing and are able to sell are making significant money because the market is booming. And then those that are at the lower end are being pushed even farther out of the option. So it's it's a bit devastating right now when yeah. we're working in housing. That's tough. Do you have a sense of numbers, like how many people are coming to you for help right now? Um, you know, not not necessarily through us. I would say on the wait list for the rental assistance, I think it's almost at, in the last I heard, I think it was almost at 7,000 that have sought assistance. Yeah, and that's through <laughs> since November. And so we don't know how many people are actually eligible, um, but we would assume a, a pretty high number of those are actually eligible. Um, it is an income-based program, so you do have to qualify. I think it's 80% of area median income is what the current um, program is looking at. Um, but it's high. It it just continues to grow. And I think what is really unfortunate is, again, you know, individuals that have been able to maintain their job, maybe have been able to work remotely. They've, they've kept some stability and security. And those that lost their job, it's just been ongoing now for over a year. Sure. I imagine that's tough, too. And I don't see how they get back to work right away. I mean, I know we're starting mm-hmm. to reopen. But are you seeing that, John? Are you seeing people well, that you're serving? Well, we have the same program with the rental and Mm-hmm. Utility assistance. We're getting forty to eighty calls a day mm-hmm. in our, our our network here. We've opened our own office just for that program over on Ajo Way near Park, and we're just overwhelmed. Uh, you know, there's only so much we can do. Uh, back to housing. Housing is a, is a very critical issue in the rural areas. We started mm-hmm. out with uh, doing self help housing, and uh, we're Basically, USDA would give a family enough for a mortgage, but that would be to buy materials, but we would supervise them in building their own homes. Oh, my goodness. And that grew, and in 1990, uh, HUD asked us to do a four-state program to build under shop self-help housing. So we built about 600 units between Hawaii and uh, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, and here in Arizona. And it was giving people that were farm workers primarily uh, the resources to build and then to supervise these subdivisions. We just finished one in Hana, Maui, Hawaii, about 14 units over there, and the families built those homes. But the nice thing about that is they learn how to take care of their home. Sure. I mentioned the pride in that. Yeah, well, and and it also saves a lot of money in repairs. But Mm -hmm. I really congratulate the work that Megan's doing, and her program is extremely important in our community. It is. Those numbers are so crazy. They're almost difficult to fathom, you know, even 40 to 80 calls a day. But 7,000 people in line for assistance. That's yeah. a huge number. Well, and I think that that's really probably very understated. So, you know, I, that, that was the number sure. of individuals that have been on there prior to really any awareness that the program was open and out there. Right. Um, so so I, I do think that, that the need is significantly higher and people aren't quite aware yet what's available. Yeah, we um, have a little newsletter that goes out to our community and we had that up as our resource last month. You know, so that people could share with people yeah. they know. Because, you know, really that's hitting a lot of people. It's yes. not just people who were already struggling in some poverty. You know, it's, it's people who had six, six-figure six salaries yeah. who got laid off, who didn't yeah. have enough savings, 
And so it's really kind of massive across the board. Yeah, mm-hmm. and housing is such a, you know, we all need it. We can't, right. we all need housing. We all need, just like food, it's the same basic need that is critical. And and so to not have access to something that you can afford is is really pretty devastating. And I do want to mention, Barbara, one of the critical things that we're trying to get awareness out right now about is actually the CDC eviction moratorium. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the individuals we'll talk to, that's kind of our first question is, have you provided your landlord with the declaration that you that you need to be covered and that, you know, with this uh, moratorium um, and that you are having these struggles based on a COVID um, response. And and a lot of folks don't know that. They think they're automatically covered, and they're not. And so I would ask that, you know, anyone that can, we're trying to get the word out that you do need to make sure that you have provided your um, landlord with that declaration notice so that you're covered, so that you will not be evicted through the process because you've you've provided that notice. It is good to know because I know in our community and you know we're up in northwest mm-hmm. Tucson so we're providing services in rural Catalina but also into Pinal County and there are some landlords who are evicting people. And yes. I keep thinking, oh my gosh, how can they get away with that? But that's an important step well, to realize. There's a lot that's come out in this process also that I think is pretty devastating to see. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done and, and it's challenging. I mean, I understand from a landlord's perspective and we sure. at Family Housing Resources, we are a landlord as well. Um, and so, you know, it's it's a struggle and especially a lot of those smaller mom and pops you know, that might own a house, a second home that they rent out, they're going to be significantly impacted without that income that they potentially rely on. A lot of folks, that's maybe their passive income that they live off of. And so, you know, it's critical that there is that support and that need. And so I understand it from their perspective, but we also want to make sure that there's not those landlords that are kind of taking advantage of some of the systems. And there is some devastating numbers right now, I think, within um, Pima County, just in terms of some of the evictions that have proceeded. We're seeing that some of the um, the process can take two minutes, less than two minutes for them to receive their eviction. Um, you know, they there's a lot of struggles. A lot of them are on Zoom still, and they're having technical difficulties. And once it's done, it's done. And that eviction order has been placed. There's not a lot to do. And so... It's, it's a little bit sad to see how quickly that goes, and I think there is a lot of work that we can do in the future to try and have some better support programs for tenants to be able to, to speak up on what's happening. That is important, I think, you're, like you're saying, the education part of it. Mm-hmm. And for me, I was surprised to learn that um, when you have an eviction, then it's, it's like your credit. Mm-hmm. You know, eviction ends up on your rental credit, if yeah. you will, and once you've had an eviction, it's hard to get another spot, even if it was Correct. unjust. So it's that's I'm seeing that. And that's kind of concerning. Well, one of the things that worries me, though, this is going to get worse. If you look out in the parking lot, wherever you go, look at all the California licenses, the people yeah. coming in, investors who are now taking a lot of those spots that you were talking about, Megan, and a lot of the rentals and yeah. things. And that's going to not get better, unfortunately. Prices are going way out. There's a lot of industry coming in to Tucson. Those people are going to need housing. And it's the people on the lower end that I, I worry yeah. about that sure. they're going to be, be facing that. Particularly, We have two properties, one in Marana, and our waiting list, we have 18 units. And uh, we have about 100 people waiting there. Yeah. And then in Gosh. Benson, we have one that's a senior HUD 202 project. 31 units, and we at least have that many down there, too, in Benson waiting to get in. And it's just, we wish we could help everybody. But Agreed. Just, mm-hmm. And the resources are going other places that rather than where they really need to be going, and that's very unfortunate. Housing has got to be a priority. Food's got to be a priority. Yeah. And the basic getting back the jobs and our economy going again. Uh, we've been a uh, the intermediary lender for SBA, mm-hmm. Uh, we have 67% of the state of Arizona. Been doing that since 1985. And um, right now, we're doing everything we can to protect our businesses. I know. I like your microloan story, your microloan program. Yeah. Well, it's uh, one that started with the Ford Foundation, gave us uh, $500,000 to capitalize our loan fund. 
and in 1999 we were recognized at the White House uh, as the first CDFI, Community hmm. F- Development Finance Institution, which is amounts to being a poor people's bank, <laughs> you want to look at it that way. And Paul, they'll uh, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, but right now, the stress on our businesses, if it wasn't for stimulus, yeah. we'd lose most of our portfolio. And I'm worried about when that stops, what's going to happen to yeah. them. The nice thing about micro lending is it provides not only access to capital, but it does give um, uh, technical assistance. And that's where we're emphasizing a lot of our work and right now and working with getting them ready for that time going forward. But we're making a number of loans as we go. We're probably a little bit ahead of where we were last year, but we're being very careful. We have a loan review committee. It's independent. They look at all the aspects that, you know, around the family and and its viability of that business going to be uh, in the new pandemic era. Is it going to survive? <laughs> That's true, too, yeah. Yeah, so those are things. But Micro lending is very, very important. Uh, we started micro lending in Maui, uh, Hawaii, several years ago. It's all seven islands now. We we don't stay with these programs. We our jobs to organize, and then train, and then turn programs over, just like we did the housing ones that I mentioned earlier. This is why we're able to diversify and, and keep moving and and being able to test more fertile ground as we go. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of worries on the horizon, especially with the influx of people, because it's they have the dollars to, to buy out the, the lower income. Sure. Mm-hmm. I think one of the nice things, too, about your program is that a lot of people, we have clients who say to us, well, we didn't think we could ever get a home loan. Yes. And we do yes. have a really wonderful uh, mortgage broker that we work with who has been able to get our clients Great. put up. But I think the other thing that's nice about PPEP is they'll, that you help people. They can come to you, and if they're not ready, mm-hmm. you help them get ready and help yeah. them build credit and give them those tools. Mm-hmm. Or build a house. They mean, yeah, we had one lady in Sarita, I remember, with her 12-year-old daughter build her two-bedroom house. This was back in the 80s. And I drove by the other day, and the house looks wonderful. <laughs> 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 of course, the kid's probably grown up by now. But, sure. Um, it's pride it, is of a leg- it is a legacy of, of what can be done. Absolutely. Um, we have a lot of other issues that we have to look in our environment right now, um, globally as well. Uh, my wife's village, uh, just this last week in Ghana, there was a microburst destroyed most of the homes. Oh, no. And they used to be in the middle of a beautiful forest with 200-year-old selk trees. And I kept warning you, you cut down those trees and uh, there's nothing to stop the wind. So we have deforestation, and that same wind crosses the ocean and we get the same that's where our hurricanes come from so it's an interesting how the domino Mm -hmm. effect in one country can also affect what we're doing here and of course conversely what we do here can affect mexico and other places like that and i really think that we're uh i uh grew up in mexico actually when i was four years old moved there and got to appreciate the culture and the country and then when i started pep my first six years was teaching Bracero migrant workers that were here under a, a work program. And they built the – Arizona is the fifth largest agricultural state in the nation, mm-hmm. the winter vegetable capital of North America. <laughs> that and, always surprised me when yeah, I first got here. Now it's like the River Nile over there. It's a yeah. beautiful area. <laughs> sure. And it's the farm workers that uh, – I think President Madison said those societies that honor the people that Mm. toil the fields shall endure. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Mesopotamia, you look at all those areas, the Pope just visited uh, the Sumerians. They were all built in the same kind of a nature and natural environment as Yuma. And I feel that's an area that's going to really grow. They're the only Mm -hmm. place left in the state where you have water and you have land. So you put all these little things together. I know it sounds like a little scatter there, but... They are like a puzzle. You have to put them together to really see what's going on in this environment. Mm-hmm. Sure. I think it's uh, – and Yuma is such an interesting place. You know, it's a great a great drive um, to drive through it and see all those vegetables. And it's shocking it's, what they want, what they bring. But I would like to just break for a quick minute because we have a, a quick um, conversation from one of our SKIP representatives who wants to share us some information. And we'll be right back. Today's program is brought to you by SKIP, the Social Service Contractors Indemnity Pool. 
Skip is a member-owned, member-directed insurance provider with more than three decades of insuring Arizona social service organizations for their property, general and professional liability, and auto claim exposures. With an Arizona-based staff of claim underwriting and risk management professionals, Skip specializes in providing personalized service, affordable premiums, and coverage which meets and often exceeds the state of Arizona's contract requirements for social service providers. For more information, visit our website at www.sscip.org or ask your insurance agent about protecting your organization with insurance coverage through Skip. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to Skip for sponsoring our show today. And I was talking just before the break about um, Yuma and, you know, your your comment, John, about the vegetable capital. Mm-hmm. I think that I don't remember the statistic, but maybe you do, the amount of the country's lettuce that mm-hmm. comes from here. And, you know, when we, we moved here from Seattle mm-hmm. and saw the same housing <laughs> issue that you were talking yeah. about, we moved in the 90s and um, pe- the prices went crazy and skyrocketed and you know, I'm sure all of that's coming. And so we decided to move down here. We already had a plan because it was a little too gray and wet and not quite the weather we were looking for in a long term. The opposite here. Exactly. We're, we're hot weather fans. So this is the perfect place for us. But, you know, to drive through Yuma and yeah. see all of that lettuce crop growing. And I don't know. Do you know the statistic of how much of the agriculture, those produce? Well, it is a winter vegetable capital, so the majority would be very easy to say that. Sure. There's a um, area between Yuma, there's two towns, Somerton and San Luis on, on the border. And um, several thousand farm workers come in every day. They have permits. They start about 2 in the morning. Mm-hmm. They cross, and they get on buses, and they go up in the fields and work, mm-hmm. come back, Probably around 10, 11, 12, because after that it gets too hot. Sure. And so they, uh, these are the people that I see as the real heroes and warriors. I agree. And um, yeah. I have two charter schools out there, public charter schools, one in Somerton, San Luis. And last month, NBC came down with Telemundo and followed two of our girls. Their parents had been deported, and they mm-hmm. stayed with their younger siblings. And these two, our, our students in our charter school, were... Uh, keeping their family going and they would get up at two in the morning to go catch the bus and work until about seven then come to school then go home and you know feed their family and migrant uh, children uh, that's why uh, Mm -hmm. they are so important to us and that uh, that little documentary showed for five minutes on uh, the um, NBC morning show and um, millions of people saw and I think it opened the eyes that these people are the real heroes, and the reason we have the society that we do is the farm workers, mm-hmm. and that's why we celebrated just last week Cesar Chavez's uh, mm-hmm. birthday. I, I was with him in 1978 and with him 1993 in Denver, the month before he passed away, mm-hmm. and uh, I saw what he had done with the farm workers to give them an opportunity to have a good, safe environment and uh, have a decent wage. Because if our farm workers are not healthy, and that's one issue we have in Yuma right Mm -hmm. now, there's a resistance to giving farm workers. Why should we give farm workers, uh, you know, vaccinations Mm -hmm. uh, when the snowbirds need it? Well, we both need it, of course. But we better remember it's the farm workers that are putting the food on our table. And I think we've forgotten this very important segment. That's why PEP's known as a migrant seasonal farm worker organization. Well, you maybe Important. can check in with the county. We at Impact, we collaborated with the <clears throat> county and did a vaccine clinic. Mm-hmm. And in the month of March and April, we vaccinated um, 890 people. That's great. So, But it was because up in the northwest there, there's so many seniors who, yeah. you know, are either technologically not savvy enough to get an appointment or <clears throat> that they don't really drive or couldn't be down driving downtown so yeah it was really important for that community so there needs to be somebody to step up and maybe figure out how to get those farm workers now in Aravaca we've had two clinics we just had our last one last week mm-hmm. we have a place called the action center and we pretty much got everybody vaccinated Great. but once again um, they're not farm workers but they're rural people mm-hmm. sure. and um, this is where we have to start looking if you drop a pebble into a pond you sh- PEP's idea is go to the furthest furthest ripple and work back in. 
whereas right now most of the philosophy is we start with these big urban centers and hope something gets out to them. And it doesn't. So True. that's why I think we found our niche over the last 55 years, trying in our small way, to, like a drop in the bucket, to reverse that trend. And I think that's the same with impact. Mm-hmm. We are out in a rural community. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And so even even our logo is that drop in the bucket with the ripples around it, because we know that access to one simple resource can change a life. And yeah. it just has a ripple effect throughout so many different areas of someone's being so about back to resources megan um you know what do you think is the biggest barrier to home ownership for most low to moderate income families well i love that um, dr arnold is talking about the access to capital i mean that that's huge and so i do think that understanding your credit building all of the education and awareness that it takes i mean this is that's part of the system that exists today you know it's it might not be the best system, but it is currently the system that you have to play in to be able to purchase a home. So you have to go through the process. Very few people, especially low income, have ability to just purchase a house outright. So it takes sort of understanding the the process, understanding your credit, how to position yourself well to, so that you will be able to get loans, that you can go through that process. And then really what we see is the biggest barrier is down payment. So mm-hmm. having the savings to be able to purchase a home and putting potentially up to 20% down is almost impossible for a lot of folks that are really sort of just living paycheck to paycheck. And so... We, you know, that's one of the ways that we're able to help as we tie people into what down payment assistance is available and, and get them access. And for some people, it can be a significant amount of funds. So when we combine some of those programs, I mean, we've seen some individuals receive up to 40 thousand dollars for a down payment that's terrific um, which is huge yeah it makes you know it actually makes it a, a realistic dream to get into home ownership and to to get into that new reality and frankly where we're at today just because you can't afford to rent or to purchase a home excuse me doesn't mean you can afford to rent any longer i think right. we're seeing such enormous increases that sometimes it actually can be more affordable to purchase but you need that support to get there you need that down payment you need that the ability to get into a home and to find a home and that was something my husband and i noticed recently some houses went up for rent in the neighborhood and uh, one of the neighbors has a child with some children is looking for a place to rent Mm -hmm. to move in closer and of course even at impact we have a lot of people who are moving in with family members to be able to afford a rent but we were commenting on some of the rents and thinking gosh that could be a house payment yeah i mean it is amazing but like you said without the down payment yeah Well, and as John said, I think we are seeing a lot of investors coming in and purchasing up properties, and we're losing a lot of the affordable properties. It's happening. There was just an article in Tucson, um, newspapertucson.com, that talked about this and a poor family that was renting for over 30 years, and the house was sold out from under them and, and led to some pretty sad outcomes. But, you know, I think also Tucson recently just made the list globally for um, having the biggest loss in affordable housing and rental housing, which is not what we want to be known for. I think, um, you know, becoming less and less in an affordable community is is the wrong direction, unfortunately. And we already saw a lot of these problems prior to the pandemic. And it's sad to see it just getting worse. So what do you think is the solution? I mean, I like your comment, Sean, about, you know, we'll just teach people how to build houses. But, of course, you have to have the property and then all and of land, those resources. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It, it, there's there's a number of solutions, I think. And I think, as as um, John also stated, it's it takes probably looking. You can't just look at one solution. It's right. got to be a bit broader. And there's and all of this is so integrated. You know, I think. Even right now, the cost of supplies for purchase, so wood, lumber, all of that has increased so significantly that building new homes are going to grow go up. Um, so I think it's going to take a lot of efforts. I think more collaboration across organizations, probably with you know the county and the and the city as well, coming together and and working on solutions and getting a bit more creative than we have been potentially in the past. And we need some major investment in that. So, you know, um, right now I think there's a big push to try and get additional resources to the State Housing Trust Fund, and I think that's critical. It will help bring some of that in, that capital in to building new affordable housing. 
Um, but I think we have to really speak up about the need out there and that this is critical. If we're only, you know, right now it's in a, in someone's interest to do higher end. You right. know, and, the, and the hope is that there will be sort of this um, trickle down or funnel down of, of affordable property because as people, if you build the higher end, then people will move up into their second home and purchase and then that'll free up the um, property they were in for more affordable. But the reality is it's not affordable anymore. I mean, in 2018, the average sale price in Tucson for a home was around 230000 And in 2021, in February, it was 310000 So that increase in less than two years is just pretty staggering. And um, so we need we need to be able to properly, you know, mass produce some of these houses to be able to look at things a little bit differently than we did before, not be so afraid of, of you know, doing some of these multifamily complexes and areas more around town. We are, oddly enough, for a community that's so spread out and that had so much land for so long, I think we all are aware that there's there's not a lot of land left other than in rural areas. And I don't know that that's, you know, we don't necessarily need to continue to spread out. We need to just think about the model slightly different. Well, and that's something that um, I have a lot of conversations with Dave Perry, who's <clears throat> president of the Oro Valley Chamber about, mm-hmm. is it's one thing to build affordable housing, but it has to be accessible. Yes. So we say that word needs to be interchanged. We need to say we need accessible housing. Yes. Because you can't just build it out. You can't build these affordable houses in a place that developers think is affordable to yeah. build in. But well, then and if it increases no costs for transportation and right. your ability to get anywhere and you don't have access to child care and other resources or schooling, I mean, Markets. then it's no longer yeah. affordable. Exactly. It's, it's just, yeah. Agreed. And, and so that's the other thing. And I know even in Catalina, you know, we've had a an apartment complex that wanted to go in mm-hmm. when we moved in there probably 12 years ago. But the people in the community don't really want an apartment complex. Right. And I know... Um, NIMBY is real, not in my backyard. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, the, with the idea that with an apartment complex must come some shady activity. And yes. it's really too bad because I think mm-hmm. it's... Maybe there's education that needs to be done in the greater population on that, too. Agreed. I I think there's um, something we really have to look at, uh, not just for the long term, but uh, we're running out of, uh, first of all, we have a state with very little private land. Mm -hmm. Most of it's owned by the government, Mm -hmm. Bureau of Land Management, et cetera, national forests, uh, Native American uh, nations. But... We're running out of water. Mm-hmm. I know even up in the Phoenix area, there's some developers trying to, to buy out cap water, oh. CAP water. And we're uh, and if you ever flown over the reservoir up at Lake Mead, it's down oh, a thousand gosh. feet, almost to the point where they will no longer produce electricity, have the capacity to, to do that. So um, we, if we don't start getting a little bit smarter and yeah. uh, keep overbuilding, uh, Without planning, I mean, there's plenty of room for growth, but it has to be very carefully thought out, and we've got to watch the water resources, or that's going to bring the whole house down. Mm-hmm. Very good point. That, it needs to be intentional. Yeah. Yeah. And then the drought has all these other uh, ramifications, the air quality. Um, if you see, my wife and I like to go well, hiking a lot up in the mountains here, and uh watching how the, even the desert plants are not surviving. The animals are, uh, the javelinas are desperate. Um, they uh, coming into the neighborhoods and coyotes. People, we're just seeing a real crunch here. And uh, all these visuals are around us showing us we're in trouble. Yeah. But we don't seem to be reacting. But we are in trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I agree. And water is such a hot topic in this yeah. state. And it is really hard to divide it up when you're in charge of that kind of thing and you've got all these different people mm-hmm. coming who need it. Mm-hmm. So that that is a huge challenge for Arizona for sure. Gosh, it's even the fires, to your point. You know, yeah. last year we had so many fires, and not just in Arizona, but our big horn fire. And and with the drought, you're right, what did we have not even five inches of rain last year yeah, or something? I think it was four inches I just heard the other yeah, day. Four and those something. extremes, I think that's right. The extremes are going to continue to be, be extreme. So right. one year of serious drought and the next year of potential flood. And so that's a little scary. Daunting. Yeah. Daunting. 
Well, how about is there anything else you want to add about family housing resources, Megan? I want to make sure. I'm curious on about how you're both funded, because I know you, some of it is past through money, you know, and during sure. COVID, we had a lot of access, as you say, to yeah. great funds <clears throat> to yeah. help us. Um, but it's just a challenge to raise funds for things. So I'm curious how you find your... It is, and this is an area that we're looking to grow. Um, so I sure. think we definitely are looking for more donations to help continue the work that we're doing. Um, right now, we we did have um, a small amount that is actually coming because we're a HUD housing counseling agency. We do have a small amount that's supported and um, funded from HUD directly. Sure. Um, but I think that they their desire is to support less than 10% of our total cost, program oh, gosh, cost. That's not much. Not much at all. And so... Um, um, so unfortunately, we definitely need additional support to continue the work that we're doing. And that really goes towards those counselors, which are really critical for providing the sort of um, advocacy and, and sort of um, peer support to get you the information and knowledge needed. And then we also do um, receive some funds that support us through our uh, property management. So as I stated, we do have some apartment complexes that we own and operate. And so some of that you know, those funds help to carry forward the work that we're doing. But with all the rental assistance now, we're really looking at philanthropy to help support a big part of what we're doing. Um, you know, as you stated, we, there has been all these funds coming through right now because of the stimulus. And those are really just covering cost, which is what we're trying to do. But to really get in front of the problems, I think we need to be able to grow capacity greater than we have. Sure. And yeah. that's, I noticed that was the challenge for us in 2020. Yes. Because, of course, food banks were all over the news. So yes. people were very generous in supporting food banks. But I think even though food is still critical, that housing piece to me seems to be the next big wave or this yeah. kind of tidal wave that's going to hit us. Yeah. And, it, and it's unfortunate because the investment it takes. Right. And making a change is is large, unfortunately. And I, so I think there's things we need to do to get a bit more creative um, to make sure that those costs stay down so that we don't have to increase costs on, on individuals that need our help. But, yeah, I think it, it does take, you know, coming from food, as you said, coming from food to housing, it's, it's shocking to me how few people were able to assist with significantly more funds just because of what it takes to get that aid. Sure. Yeah. We need some partners. On the funding side, <clears throat> we've used U e EDA, the Economic mm -hmm. Development Administration, HUD, sure. for the self-help housing, and USDA is a very viable mm -hmm. rural area. So we were offered uh, $2.8 million in stimulus. We turned it down and uh, mm -hmm. felt we did not want to. We felt other groups such as Megan's and others really needed it, and we had uh, watched our dollars well. Mm-hmm. And uh, we didn't lay anybody off. Wonderful. Nice. Uh, PEP never shut down. Our biggest problem is finding a parking space. I've been parking <laughs> in the street the last week because everybody's working. And uh, we have a committed board of directors in that area. So those are just a little bit of phil philosophical points there. And I want to share one thing I think is very important. On the medical side, we haven't mm -hmm. hit too much on that. But <clears throat> we started a program. Uh, helping people with medical equipment and wow. walkers and wheelchairs. And then we found a, another partner, uh, PSMA. It was called Southwest Medical Aid. They merged under our one of our programs. We created a distribution center, and we send um, hundreds of thousands of pounds of uh, durable, non-durable medical supplies. We have up to 28 doctors and nurses that are retired that sort through everything at our, our distribution center. We just sent a cargo container to Honduras because of the, and we uh, actually partnered with the Catholic Church as a program in that. And we're sending another one to Ghana. But most of our works here, we uh, supply El Rio, we supply uh, the Tucson Fire Department. So people come back and forth. So if you have any uh, wheelchairs or in your uh, storage room or walkers or crutches or any other kind of equipment we can certainly use it just right across the border we're working with a couple dozen clinics down there some are on part of the to nation which is part of mexico and they 
built nice clinic buildings but didn't give them a stitch of, uh, mm. of equipment. So we've been <laughs> sure. supplying those. And all of this is purely volunteer. There's no no money in this. Our executive director, we say, is the highest paid executive director. <laughs> they haven't quite reached a penny yet. So. <laughs> and so anyway, those are the kinds of things that I think we have to point that out is very important, just like the food security. Mm-hmm. We do this all on the volunteer thing, sure. and we, we, we serve thousands of people. If the government was going to try to serve thousands of people, how much <laughs> would they charge a head? Oh, it would be so costly. Yeah. That's yeah, so and, true. And uh, talking about the life changer, I have pictures that I, I brought today, um, visuals I'm leaving. One wheelchair is a life changer down in Agua Prieta uh, across the border from Douglas. We've been helping the hospital there. Mm-hmm. And they've been re- uh, what they get from us, they help supply uh, the other clinics down, down the real Sonora area. But one young man um, got a wheelchair. He'd been laying on the floor and sleeping on a mat and everything. But to see the uh, smile on his face to get that wheelchair, that's a real life changer. So I see a lot of things that are happening today that don't need government money. Mm-hmm. Sure. They just need people mm-hmm. and people that care and people that are willing to, as you said, the social investors. Those are very important for us. Uh, the faith-based groups are mm-hmm. very important for us. And we all need to be united and, and realize it's not always the government money that's going to uh, do things. Uh, even in our work in Central America, Mexico, and in Africa, we don't use any of our program of funds. We get all of that donated. Sure. And and we don't get government money in any of those countries. We organize people under the old community action <clears throat> model that came out of the Civil Rights Act mm-hmm. in 1964, which ta- ta- uh, taught people to help themselves and to do sweat equity. Well, this is really the whole point of this show for me, is to connect these nonprofits, our superheroes really in the community, <clears throat> with the community members yeah. and with each other, because we have thousands of nonprofits in Tucson. Yes. And, you know, there's so many of us are doing things that the community does not even realize we're doing. Yes. And they, or they think of us. Like PPAP. In one. Having one yeah. general We've, program. I've learned a lot today. <laughs> Definitely. And I think that that's the idea, that how can we help our listeners find a connection to the things that they're passionate about? Yeah. And even that one thing, John, about the medical equipment, you know, you're talking gently used equipment is okay. Mm-hmm. And that's, we used to deal in some of that, and then we didn't have the space to store mm-hmm. it. And we live, Impact lives in the mid the um, retirement community Mm -hmm. so we would get a million walkers donated because someone would have a surgery Mm. and then they would be provided with a walker just the basic walker but then when they were recovered they would come down to us and say do you can you pass this Mm -hmm. on and so that is great to know because i think there's a lot a lot of the durable medical Mm -hmm. groups or people that did that have kind of gone to the wayside we really need equipment we're getting so overwhelmed Right now, and uh, we're getting uh, things out of Phoenix, uh, Phoenix everywhere. Mm. So can... overwhelmed with need, yes, not overwhelmed we, with equipment. We need equipment, okay. and the need is there to yeah. provide that equipment. So if you have a wheelchair, sure. if you have a walker, you know, those are life changers yeah. in, in many yeah, areas that, that we're working in, especially in the, the, the Native American reservations. Mm-hmm. Right now, there's a lot of need for those those kinds of things. Our our website, which is ppep.org, you can uh, kind of uh, hone in on on where we are with some of those things. Sure. And mm-hmm. on this um, with the podcast, there's a web page for the <clears throat> show, mm-hmm. so Great. our listeners will be able to connect with Megan and with Dr. John Arnold, and they'll awesome. be able to get the information for the non profit websites and the Facebook Great. and all those things you know, to I connect. I make one other comment um, yeah. during this process, and I, and I love your sort of thought on this, Barbara, of trying to connect us so that we can have greater reach and impact, and we don't all have to reinvent the wheel. We can rely on each other to you know help support the work that we're doing, but I also have been actually really um, pleased to see some of the collaboration that has come out from the pandemic in regards to some of the services. So, you know, this is a devastating, been a devastating year for a lot of people, but it also pushed us to do things differently. 
And, you know, in particular with the rental assistance, and there's been a, a large group that's been meeting every Monday through the county and the city and a lot of us service agencies and a lot of the nonprofits coming together and talking through both the situations, the issues, some of the constables that have to issue these evictions um, are there on the call. And it's actually been you know, I, I hate to say it, but it's really been nice to see because we are coming together, talking about the situations and brainstorming together on some of the solutions in a way that we had not done before. And so this is a hard, challenging year, but I think there's been some positive that I hope to see us really kind of invest in going forward. Well, well, that's a good point because I think innovation really has come out this mm -hmm. year. Uh, yes, I, John. I wanted to say one thing. We talked about the partnerships among the nonprofits, and we talked about EDA, USDA, but also the city and county have, have been all a long-term partner of ours. Mm -hmm. We yes. were emphasizing the volunteer because that's what we were talking about, but I didn't mean in any way to leave out the great partnerships with the county and the city. And with South Tucson, South Tucson mm -hmm. is a very special area that needs a lot of help right now. Yeah. Good people there. And once again, like rural people, we're kind of like uh, like the rich man with Lazarus and under the table. We're trying to catch all these crumbs. Mm -hmm. We just need to be brought to the top of the table. That's all we're asking is rural people to have that kind of uh, recognition and respect. That's it. I mm -hmm. think it's coming. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. The, it, all of COVID kind of put us in a new way of thinking mm -hmm. and having to collaborate and having to cover so many different people and needs and everybody pivoted. So mm -hmm. I think we will all find ourselves at the table very mm -hmm. soon. Yeah. So well, I so appreciate you coming to be on the show today, both of you, and sharing all the things you're passionate about and that you're making such a big difference in for our community. Mm -hmm. So I think, do you have, is there anything, I think we're ready to wrap it up. Do you have any last hurrahs, something you want to say before we say goodbye? Well, I just want to say thank you. I think it's fantastic that you're doing this show. I'm excited to connect again, and, and this is part of the Tucson joy, I think, is just we are a small community and a growing community, but um, I, this has been a pleasure to be here, and I just appreciate being able to speak about not only food and security and housing, but all the other issues that were kind of discussed today. It's it's hard to not recognize how related all of these issues are and that we can't just think in a in a vacuum. We have to be creative and, and explore new opportunities. Well, thank you. And I just think the same thing, what uh, Megan has said, but also that we got to be good stewards of the land, mm -hmm. yes. good stewards of the air, good stewards of the water, or all of this is going to come crushing down mm -hmm. on top of us. I think you're right. And good you, advice. And you remember uh, when the Pope visited Ur and he visited uh, Somalia, uh, Samaria, those were the first organized cities. As long as they are responsive and took care of their resources, and they were very desert like we were, they survived. But once that went away, when they forgot about their fundamentals and about their security and about their investment and about their climate and water, they went away. They're just dust now. Well, that's we need to learn from history and not repeat it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you again for being here and for our listeners for listening and learning more about the <clears throat> nonprofits and in Tucson that are impacting not just Tucson, but the greater community altogether. Thanks again.